Many high performance aircraft use acceleration control. So here we're gonna look at how such controllers are employed. We're gonna develop a simple proportional integral acceleration control architecture. We're gonna explain its structure. We'll develop it in the time domain, the frequency domain. We'll analyze this controller in simulation. And in doing so, we'll observe the so-called non-minimum phase response. We'll explain this important response characteristic both physically and mathematically. We're gonna apply the acceleration controller to a transport aircraft. And finally, we're gonna look at the acceleration controller as applied to the transport aircraft and then to supersonic missile. We'll find the differences and commonalities between the application of the controller and these two platforms. So let's get started. To hit its target, a missile has to maneuver. This is usually done by meeting acceleration commands from a guidance homing loop. And for this, the missile will deflect its fins to create incidence on the wings, which produces acceleration in both the lateral and longitudinal planes of motion. Alternatively, consider this high-performance aircraft. It can roll to a desired maneuver plane and then pitch to pull multiple G's of acceleration. In both of these examples, an acceleration command tracking control system is required for maneuvering. Acceleration tracking is achieved with a simple proportional integral control architecture. Let's start with acceleration error, then integrate and scale by a gain. Now we also add a proportional control to pitch rate. We add the two signals together and the result is an elevator command that goes to the actuation system that produces achieved elevator position which affects the aircraft dynamics which outputs acceleration and angular rate. In the frequency domain the controller is an algebraic expression. In the time domain it's a differential equation. So the purpose of the inner loop the proportional control on pitch rate is to dampen oscillation. This is the so-called artificial damping. We have to get the angular rates under control in order to maneuver. And this is increasingly important for highly maneuverable vehicles because they often are nearly unstable. The outer loop achieves the desired turning or maneuver. This is accomplished with acceleration command tracking. This is the PI controller. This is the plant. It's the combination of the actuation system and the rigid body dynamics in series. We can represent the controller as K of S. It has three inputs and one output. We represent the plant as P of S. It has one input and two outputs. Then in its most abstract form, we have our feedback diagram. Now our objective is to pose the PI control law in the form of an LTI state space system. Here, the subscript C is for controller. Y is the plant output. U is the commanded control input to the plant. And R is the commanded acceleration. If we define error as AZ minus AZ command, and then integrate that error, creating a new variable, EIAZ, we can differentiate EIAZ to get AZ minus AZ command and simply write this expression as an LTI system, where the state is EIAZ. The feedback control law, U equals minus KX, is now written below. 
where the matrices of the LTI system are immediately identified. We have the LTI dynamic controller and the LTI plant. We can now investigate this architecture with aircraft dynamics. We first work with linearized models determined about the trimmed condition. Let's take a look at the rigid body dynamics, which are the same as that used in the previous sections. Note the zero in the alpha dot B matrix. This element represents vertical force due to elevator over trimmed airspeed. The value of zero means that the elevator does not create a vertical force, which does not make sense because clearly below it, minus 0.011 indicates that elevator creates a moment. So force must be produced. The solution is to add a new term to the aerodynamic buildup, a CZ del E, which was apparently missing. We then relinearize the equations and obtain a new LTI description of the rigid body dynamics. And now note that Z del E over V has a non-zero, albeit small value. This is responsible for an important property of aircraft acceleration models, the non-minimum phase response. Suppose we want to accelerate this aircraft up. We need to pitch up. So to do this, we pitch the elevator trailing edge up. This creates an immediate vertical force that pushes the airframe down, causing downward acceleration. But it also creates moment to pitch the nose up. And the change in angle of attack on the body after pitch up pushes the aircraft upwards. In aircraft, the non-minimum phase effect is that initial downward dip prior to acceleration in the opposite and desired direction. Let's mathematically explore this. Extract the short period dynamics. Use the acceleration approximation. Take the Laplace transform to get the AZ over del E transfer function. The numerator has two zeros due to the second order polynomial. Break it out term by term. The second order response without the zeros is here. The other two terms are due to the presence of the zeros. They are the scaled first and second derivative of the second order response. From the signs of each term, we determine that we have a right half plane zero. Now compare the step response for each term in the transfer function. The third term dominates. The first and second terms reveal zero contributions. They tend to bring the second order response down initially before it comes to equilibrium at about 1.5. The downward transient is due to their negative coefficient. And their coefficients indicate a right half plane zero. Note the coefficients of the first and second terms are also one to two orders of magnitude smaller than the third term. So when we take their sum and compute the AZ step response, we see the small non-minimum phase dip due to small Z del E. Scale it up 30 times and we get the point. Depending on how severe the non-minimum phase dip is, it can add to the rise time and therefore decrease the performance of the aircraft under acceleration control.
Looking at the root locus, we can see the right half plane zero of the short period. Also shown is the blue short period and fugoid modes, and then the extracted short period in red, a good approximation. So as integral error gain increases, we know poles will approach zeros. Hence, the right half plane zero may attract the closed loop poles. This is a concern. So let's investigate the actual root loci for the extracted short period. Let's orient ourselves. Open loop short period in blue. Short period open loop zeros in green. Close loop short period eigenvalues in white, the pair, and then the integrator closed loop eigenvalue. In this case, the closed loop eigenvalues overlay on the open loop because the gains are set to zero. There is no control effort. Letting the integral gain go from zero to three, we see the pattern. The short period moves into the right half plane and the integrator moves leftward toward the left half plane zero. The integrator becomes faster as KEIAZ increases. Now with the damping gain of minus 10. Same type of pattern, but notice the start of the closed loop short period was shifted with slightly greater damping. Now minus 20. Minus 40, minus 80, and a new pattern with further damping having a slow dominant pole. And what seems to be suitable are the gains associated with this pattern. Now, this was done only for the short period. Let's check the root locus for the modally coupled 4x4 rigid body dynamics. We choose minus 80 for KQ as it provided decent damping previously. And as we can see, the short period and the integrator follow a similar pattern as before, while the fugoid remains around the origin. The fugoid eigenvalues circle in to the right half plane before being directed back to the left half. For all these gains from 0 to 3, for integral error. The fugoid remains near the imaginary axis. So if it is unstable, it's a slow instability. Now here's the corresponding Nyquist diagram just for the extracted short period. The crossing of the critical point corresponds to the short period eigenvalues moving into the right half plane. In the time domain, we see decreasing rise time prior to the short period poles approaching the imaginary axis, where then oscillation and ultimately instability occurs. Let's break this down frame by frame. For the very small integral error gain of 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 That looks really nice. Slight overshoot, minimal undershoot. So we go forward with the selected integral gain, minus 80 for proportional control. So now let's assess for the modally coupled closed loop system. For the selected gains, we see nice short period response initially, but then those dynamics decay, and what's left is the slower fugoid. Unstable, long period. Acceleration controllers are often employed on systems that require high maneuverability. So let's compare this transport aircraft to the highly maneuverable supersonic missile. First, Note the differences in the A matrix. The M alpha of the transport aircraft is minus 0.77. 
that of the missile minus 1.47. The larger M alpha of the missile is associated with a higher frequency of the second order system. Also note, the pitch damping of the missile is negligible, zero, but it's significant in the transport aircraft. Both of these things, high frequency, low damping, means a highly oscillatory response in the missile dynamics. The other thing to note is the size of the B matrix. Look at how much more effective the missile is for unit deflection of the elevator compared to the transport aircraft. But this makes sense. The missile is much, much faster and has a larger ratio of control surface area to planform area. In terms of second order parameters, the open loop aircraft short period is reasonably well damped, 0.55. It's got a time constant of 1.73 seconds. The missile short period is highly under damped, as expected. It has a natural frequency roughly 80 times greater than the aircraft and a time constant of 140 milliseconds, much, much smaller. Comparing their open loop eigenvalues, we see two very different time scales, but both are complex pairs, oscillatory interchange between angle of attack and pitch rate. Their open loop responses illustrate these second order systems. Here's the transport aircraft, a very nice open loop response. The missile, stable, but highly underdamped, faster. Look at the time scales. The root loci show similar patterns. Short period moving into the right half plane, integral air moving left. But check out the gains for the missile. We mentioned the missile had much more control effectiveness. The B matrix was much larger, and this is leading to much smaller gains being needed to move the closed loop poles. So now the closed loop step response. The transport aircraft rise time, 63% is 3.2 seconds. The missile, 80 milliseconds. This transport aircraft is not designed to be high performance. It's designed to cruise. This missile is a high performance machine. It's designed to accelerate, and so it does. And we see the differences between these two systems. While they both had similar root locus characteristics. To review, we've covered how acceleration control could be used to steer a vehicle with direct acceleration, which is the so-called skid to turn, or a roll to a desired maneuver plane, the so-called bank to turn. We discussed acceleration PI control architecture and rationale. We looked at the state space formulation, the non-minimum phase response. We applied the controller to a transport aircraft and looked at the effect on the short period as we tuned it for various damping and tracking gains. We finally ended with a comparison between the acceleration control of the aircraft and missile. And from this, we now have a better understanding of acceleration control for aircraft. This is Flight Control Fundamentals Section 1.5. Access this lesson and more at learngnc.com.